Hey Optimancers, Chris here. In my last video, I discussed the Rogue class in Playtest 6, and today I'm going to go over the Bard, which has some very interesting ideas, and also some walkbacks on some previous changes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over the base class, and then I'll go over the subclasses, and this is the only class that got a totally new subclass, the College of Dance, and then I'm going to wrap up with some analysis of what they presented. I'm going to go over both the changes to the 2014 Bard, as well as any changes we saw from the Bard in the Expert Classes Playtest. We saw this in the Expert Classes Playtest Bard as well, which is the Bard now only gets simple weapon proficiency. The 2014 Bard also has Hand Crossbow, Longsword, Rapier, and Short Sword Proficiency. So all those have been removed. And what it seems like to me is the Bard traditionally has been kind of a jack of all trades. So they do a little bit of the martial stuff, a little bit of the spell casting, a little bit of skills, um, just kind of a bit of everything. Then in fifth edition, we kind of saw more of a leaning towards this is a spell caster who can kind of dabble in some other stuff. And now what I'm seeing here is this is a spell caster who does skills. Um, but the, the martial stuff, if you have it at all, it's through your subclass not through the base bard anymore. Now, I definitely want to talk about bardic inspiration. Inspiration now lasts an hour instead of 10 minutes, and that is quite a boost. But also, this version says that you use the inspiration when you fail a d20 test, potentially turning that failure into success. And I'll just remind you that the 2014 version specifically said it was used after the roll, but had to be used before the DM says whether the role succeeded. So this is, technically speaking, a boost as well. But I have to ask at this point, and you can let me know in the comments, were you playing the way it was written? I think tables I play at were pretty much using inspiration as it's written here and have been for years. Like, if the character with inspiration, say, rolled a a 12 for a saving throw. Then the DM will say, you know, that succeeded or that failed. And if they say it failed, then we would still let that character roll inspiration to modify the roll. I can't remember the last time I heard a DM say, you know, sorry, too late. You had to announce that you were using inspiration before I said it failed. I, and I think we started playing the way it was written, like when we started playing fifth edition and we abandoned it really quickly. So I think it's probably been eight years of playing it like this, um, just because I find it's a super big inconvenience for the DM to have to wait to announce whether something succeeded or failed so that they can give the player a chance to determine if they want to use a modifier like inspiration or not. Um, it'd be, essentially what it would end up being is like the character would roll they would announce their total, and then the DM would have to wait and say, okay, do you have anything you want to do to this role before I let you know if that succeeded or failed? And that just doesn't seem to flow very well. So whenever that kind of interaction comes up, I generally treat it like this. So yeah, I'll announce it's a failure. Player says I'm going to use inspiration, and that's just fine. But I am curious if any of you are still playing the way it's written in the 2014 Player's Handbook. And if so, do you like playing it that way? Uh, do you find it an inconvenience or not? And if you like it, I would really like to know why. Now, there is one way this is worse than the current version. By requiring a failed D20 test, that means there's some tests that don't have a pass-fail metric, and you won't be able to use inspiration for those anymore. Like... I see players using inspiration to up their initiative in combat. And depending on the initiative order, sometimes I do as well. But you can't do that anymore because there's no such thing as failing an initiative role. But what I really want to talk about is the inspiration in the expert classes playtest. In that document, inspiration was used as a reaction when an ally failed a test, or used for a reaction healing if that ally took damage. And according to the design notes here, it says the healing option was removed to prevent hoarding the inspiration. And okay, fair enough. But I didn't really care about that because as far as the bard went in the expert classes playtest, my favorite part of that bard 
was that Bardic Inspiration now used a reaction. And in playtesting, I really liked it. And I can tell you that, I mean, I just played in a game last week and it wasn't the playtest where we had two bards and one of them was straight class, one of them was multi-classed and they were handing out inspiration and then there was a big saving throw and then there was this confusion. Who was giving out inspiration to whom? Who had it? Who didn't? Who had expended it already? Who hadn't? Which bard had given inspiration to whom? Because they were different dice. One of them was a d8 and one of them was a d10. And we basically had to kind of guess. And we continued with gameplay after about five minutes of delay. And we might have got it right. We might have gotten it wrong. We're not quite sure. And that is all cleaned up by making the Bardic Inspiration a reaction. Now the Bard just needs to keep track of, did I use my reaction or not? And how many have I used? And it just is so much cleaner. And the design notes here don't say why they've reverted to the reaction. I suspect it is so that it fits more with like the old subclasses. Some of them have features where, you know, if somebody uses their Bardic Inspiration die and they fail, then they can reuse it. Or if they use the Bardic Inspiration die, it can be passed off to another player. And those aren't compatible with reaction-based inspiration. So I'm guessing it's about backwards compatibility. And this is another case where we find backwards compatibility is maybe a negative in terms of actually making a better game in the 2024 Player's Handbook. Because I'm going to really miss reaction-based inspiration I am so disappointed to see it reverted to using a bonus action again. I'm just going to take a moment to remember Reaction Inspiration. Now, the number of uses you have of Inspiration has been restored to your Charisma modifier instead of Proficiency bonus, and I'm A-OK -okay with that. The scaling of the die type from a D6 to eventually a D12 at 15th level, same as it has always been. So, this version of Inspiration is, I think, more powerful than the 2014 version, and it's potentially more powerful than the Expert Classes playtest, but I just wish more players had supported the reaction-based system. So now we need to talk about spellcasting because, wow. Okay, so first let's go over the little stuff. So in the expert classes playtest, spell preparation used this experimental system where your spell slots determine how many spells you could prepare of each level and you could switch them all out after a long rest. And they've abandoned that system and had already abandoned it before this playtest. So it's back to the old system where you can choose any spell you can cast to prepare and you can switch out one spell when you gain a bard level. Now they're calling it preparation, but it's basically the same as the spells known mechanic in the 2014 Player's Handbook. The number of spells known or prepared also isn't quite the same as the 2014 bard. They both start out with four, but this bard scales more quickly at low levels and then more slowly at high levels. Uh, the number of preparation seems to be based more on spell slots rather than you know, having a even progression, but ultimately it lands at the same 22 spells at 20th level. You also get Vicious Mockery for free, so every bard is going to have it now. And Vicious Mockery got a boost in this playtest. It now does a d6 damage instead of a d4. But now let's talk about the big change, and that is the spells that you can choose. This is a massive change, both from the last playtest and the 2014 bard. So the 2014 Bard gets the Bard spell list, which is a middle-of-the-road spell list, maybe a little below average. It's better than the Warlock's spell list, and it is probably better than the Cleric's spell list, though that could be debated. Then, in the Expert Classes playtest, the Bard chose Arcane spells, but they could not choose any Abjuration, Conjuration, Evocation, 
or necromancy spells. So that's half the spell schools right there. So very restrictive. Way, way more restrictive than warlock, sorcerers, or wizards in that last playtest. But now, in this playtest, the bard actually chooses their spell list from any of the three. So they can choose arcane, primal, or divine, and they have no spell school restriction at all. So you can choose for your bard to be an arcane bard, a divine bard, or a primal bard. And spoiler, at higher levels, the bard can select spells from any of these three spell lists. I saw a comment from someone discussing this, and they figured that the bard is just going to select the arcane spell list. And they might, uh, but hold on, it really depends what you're going for. I could see selecting one of the other lists depending on the build I'm making. Like, maybe I want a Spirit Guardians Bard. Maybe I want a Summoning Bard or a Spike Growth Bard. Arcane is a strong choice, and I would expect that it will probably be the most common selection, but I think it is going to depend what you're going for. Also, it might depend on what other casters your party has. So, this is really strong, and even if it was just Arcane, it is still a huge buff compared to either the 2014 or the last playtest bard, giving you the choice of all three even more so. Then at level 2, bards get Expertise and Jack of All Trades. Expertise has always been a bard feature. It's gained at 3rd level in the 2014 bard, but it had already been moved to 2nd level in the Expert Classes playtest. And Jack of All Trades is back at 2nd level. The Expert Classes playtest had moved this all the way to 5th level, and I am really glad to see it back at 2nd. One thing they did preserve from the last playtest bard is that Jack of All Trades now only applies to skill checks where you don't have proficiency. And that's actually a pretty big nerf because the 2014 Jack of All Trades applies to initiative and it also applies to other ability checks like if you're escaping a web or counterspelling or using the telekinesis spell. And those are just some examples. Now, I think it is probably safe to say that when they were writing the 2014 Player's Handbook, they didn't consider those other uses for Jack of All Trades. So I get the change to wording that excludes those things. One thing, though, about the wording here, and I talked about this in my last video as well, is I wonder how tool use is going to be handled in the 2024 Player's Handbook. Because the Jack of All Trades feature in the current Bard applies to tool usage, which I think it obviously should. You would think someone who's a jack of all trades would know a little bit about using carpenter's tools or navigation tools or picking locks. I'm curious to see how that all shakes out, but this is likely a sign that all tool use is going to be tied to a skill proficiency. The current rules glossary for tools proficiency does seem to imply that when you use a tool, there will be a skill check involved. And if you have proficiency in both the tool and the skill, you get advantage on the test. But they haven't spelled out how that works. Like, if I want to use Smith's tools to forge a sword, what skill am I rolling? It doesn't tell me, and it will need to tell us. Also, it begs the question how Jack of All Trades combines with these rules. So let's say I'm proficient in Thieves' tools, and let's say it turns out to be Sleight of Hand is the skill used for picking locks, and I'm not proficient in Sleight of Hand. Does Jack of All Trades do nothing in that case? You would think it would do something in that situation. That is going to need to be clarified. I know in playtests I've been involved in, we've just been using the rules for tools in the 2014 Player's Handbook because the playtest hasn't provided the information we need to really playtest this yet. At 4th level, there's an ability score improvement, and I'm not going to call these out at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th. They're all there at the usual levels, but keep in mind that ability score improvement feat says you can raise your score up to 22 at 19th level, so with a Bard, Charisma plus 2, that's probably the best play at level 19. And I don't think I mentioned this in my Rogue video, and this isn't a difference mechanically. But I did notice they're calling these Ability Score Improvements now, instead of Feats, like they were in the previous playtest. Then in the description, it mentions that you can take the Ability Score Improvement feat, or some other feat. At 5th level, the Bard gets Font of Inspiration. This is the feature that lets the Bard recover inspiration after a short rest. It's been 5th level all along, but in the Expert Classes playtest, they had upped it to 7th level, which I did not like. So I'm glad to see it restored to 5th level. There's also a little change here. So it says that if you have no uses of Bardic Inspiration left, 
you can give yourself one use by expending a spell slot, which I assume includes first level spell slots, and it requires no action. You can only do this once per turn. I don't know why you would do it more than once per turn. So yeah, and a nice little option there. And when it comes to inspiration, is it better than a first level slot? I don't think it necessarily is, but it might be as good as a first level slot. So it might be worth doing. At 6th level, there's a subclass feature. Then at 7th level, the bard gets Counter Charm. Now, Counter Charm in the 2014 bard is a throwaway feature. And they had just gotten rid of it in the Expert Classes playtest. And I don't think anyone really minded because the 2014 Counter Charm is that bad. Now it's back at 7th level instead of 6th. But this version is significantly improved. Instead of needing to be done as an action before the saving throw takes place, which required some serious prescience, now it's a reaction to provide a reroll for someone who has already failed the saving throw against being charmed or frightened, and that reroll gets advantage on the test. I wasn't sad to see the 2014 version gone in the expert classes playtest, but I like this version of Counter Charm way, way better. It's actually quite good. It basically means that all your allies within 30 feet of you have this fail-safe against being charmed or frightened, and this does not have limited uses. Now, it is a reaction and affects only one ally, so I guess the limit is how often you can use it like during a round, but when it comes to like a day of adventuring, you can just use it over and over again. So I'm hoping that in the survey, they don't get a lukewarm response to this being a reaction like they must have with inspiration. Then we have expertise gained at ninth level, same as the last playtest bard, and it's one level earlier than the 2014 bard. And then at 10th level, another really big feature. So the 2014 version of Magical Secrets allows the bard to choose two spells from any spell list of a level they could cast, and they become spells known for that bard. In the last playtest, Magical Secrets was level 11, and it allowed you to prepare two spells from any spell list, but it preserved the restriction on spell schools, Remember, they could only select from about half the spell schools. That applied to their Magical Secrets as well. Now, Magical Secrets just says you can choose spells from any of the three spell lists. This is going to include the spell you gain at level 10, and you can switch out one of your previously prepared spells because you just gained a level. Then at level 11, and every level afterwards, you could continue to swap out previously prepared spells and pick a spell from any list with any increases to preparation slots. So, wow, right? And yeah, this is really, really good. But I should point out there is one little nerf from the 2014 version. This only includes spells from the Arcane, Divine, and Primal spell lists, and those aren't comprehensive lists. So this now excludes all the class-specific spells. Like, the 2014 bard could select Fine Steed, now they can't, because it's a paladin-specific spell. Or the crazy wizard spells that I assume are going away or getting nerfed in the future playtests, or they better be anyways, those wouldn't be available either. Now I've seen some discussion that maybe the bard has just become the most powerful caster in the game, because, you know, at 10th level you're getting access to all three of the major spell lists. And I think there's an argument for that, but I also think you gotta look at things like Sorcery points that enhance magical spells that sorcerers get. Uh, you know, wizard subclasses tend to really boost their spell casting. I don't really see that so much with the bard. And so I'm not convinced that the bard is necessarily the most powerful caster, but it certainly has become the most versatile caster. So this is a huge gain for bards overall, and it's really good. But just keep in mind, it's not access to every spell. But what it does do is, if the bard is a jack-of-all-trades, at least in terms of spellcasting, they definitely are. Superior Inspiration is gained at 18th level, and it gives you two uses of bardic inspiration if you've run dry. This is similar to the old capstone, but actually the old capstone only gave you one use. That's in the 2014 Player's Handbook. What should be changed here, though, is this should work whether you're out of inspiration or not. Just let the bard regain two expended uses, or one, but whether they're completely out or not. You shouldn't have to run dry to get this feature. Now, I'm glad this isn't the capstone anymore. It was an awful capstone. So let's look at the new capstone, Words of Creation. And this 
is nice. So you get two spells, Power Word Heal and Power Word Kill, as free preparations. So I think we should take a quick look at the spells. So Power Word Heal, I've always considered the inferior cousin to the Mass Heal spell, which a bard might take as a magical secret. Power Word Heal has been improved though. It used to be a touch spell. Here they've given it a very generous 60 foot range. And the old version didn't work on undead or constructs. And that usually doesn't matter. But the restriction is gone. The nice thing about Mass Heal is you can spread it out. So you get these 700 hit points as a pool. And you can spread them out between your party. And as long as you don't go over the 700 hit point cap, which is a big, big cap, you can usually heal the entire party up to full hit points, right in the middle of a combat. It removes the blinded and deafened conditions, which isn't as good as the list here for Power Word Heal. But most of the time, I see either of these spells used to restore hit points primarily. And Mass Heal is just better at doing that. And then there's the Power Word Kill spell, which has also been improved. The 2014 version does nothing to a creature with more than 100 hit points, and that sucks. Now at least it delivers 12d12 psychic damage, which averages 78, which isn't a huge number for a 9th level spell to be honest, but it is something, and it, there's no saving throw, so they can't have that damage, they're just going to take the full 12d12. So back to words of creation, when you cast either of those spells we just covered, you can target a second creature as long as it's within 10 feet of the first target. So a little bit like twinning the spell, at least the 2014 version of twinning a spell, which in the cases of these spells would be nine sorcery points. So neither of these spells are necessarily my top choices for ninth level spells, but with a free kind of twinning, that could be another story entirely. Now mass heal is still probably healing more hit points than even a twinned power word heal. And even a twinned power word kill isn't a massive game changer, even with the improvements. But they both now have at least the potential of being worth that valuable ninth level slot. I like this way more than the old capstone where you got one inspiration if you were out. And that's the base part. So let's talk subclasses and then I'll come back to some of the big changes here. One general thing I'm gonna say is reverting to the old subclass progression and bonus action inspiration does achieve a greater degree of backwards compatibility. In fact, it pretty much makes backwards compatibility flawless. Now, I think I've been candid about this, but I'll say it again. I don't care about backwards compatibility. I get excited by new options. So you give me a new player's handbook with new or revised subclasses and classes, they're what I wanna play. I don't really wanna play a bard and then go back and look at my old books for the subclass. I want to play one of the new subclasses, the new shiny toys. Uh, but if you are one of those players that enjoys going back to your old books because there's this subclass that you like and it's not included anymore, and that's the one you want to play, then this is going to achieve that for you. So I want to do a little bit of an informal poll and just tell us down below, do you care about backwards compatibility? Is it important to you that when the new player's handbook comes out that you can play an eloquence bard and it is seamless or do you not care? Do you just want to play the new stuff? Uh, because yeah, I've told you what I think, but I know some people want to continue to play the old stuff and combine it with the new stuff. And, and I'm just curious because if you're somebody who's just going to stick with the old 2014 player's handbook anyways, then this shouldn't matter to you at all. None of this should matter to you at all. But if you are planning to get the new player's handbook and use those rules, how important to you is it that you still have your Tasha's and Xanathar's options that you can go back to? But speaking of shiny new toys, we have a brand new subclass for Bard, the College of Dance. And I don't think I need to really describe what it is. It's a Bard who dances. So at third level, there's two features. The first one's Dazzling Footwork, and it requires that you aren't using armor or using a shield. So the obvious comparison to monks is being made. First, you get unarmored defense. That sets your base armor class at 10, plus your dexterity and charisma modifier. So this is the same as monks, except it's charisma based instead of wisdom based. Now bards have light armor proficiency. And I would imagine that if you don't invest in feats to improve your armor, then with that kind of build, 
this unarmored defense will be an improvement over studded leather, even magical studded leather, because we're going to be increasing our charisma, and that means that our armor class will go up with this feature. We're probably talking about armor class 16 at level 1, 17 at level 4, 18 at level 12, 19 at, well, level 19. Now, if I want a good armor class on my bard, this isn't the way I'm going to go. It might be better than light armor, but a bard can get medium armor and shield proficiency at level 1 now. And that's going to be an 18 armor class right out of the gate. But for a bard that doesn't go that way, this is still probably a bit better than light armor. Agile Strike says that when we use inspiration as part of an action, a bonus action, or a reaction, we can make an unarmed strike as well. Bardic Damage says we use Dexterity for that unarmed strike, and we use our Bardic Inspiration die for damage. Again, like a monk, but yeah, the Bardic Inspiration die actually scales to a d10 and a d12 faster than the monk's martial arts die. A uh, monk, you need some help. Now, I'm not really keeping up with the online discourse, so I'm not sure whether what I'm going to say is original or whether it's been said many times before, and I'm not sure if this is a hot take or not. But if I was going to play a College of Dance bard, uh, I could either not wear armor and use this feature, or I could wear armor and not use this feature at all. And I would be inclined towards the second. I think I would be inclined towards taking the medium armor proficiency, putting on medium armor and a shield, and giving up on unarmored defense because I'm going to have a better armor class anyways. And then I give up on agile strikes and bardic damage, which I think is a no big deal because... Agile Strikes isn't that great. We're not using that many Inspiration. And in fact, there's a feature later in this class that I'm more likely to use Inspiration on that Agile Strikes doesn't apply to because it doesn't use an action. So I might not be using Agile Strikes very much at all with my Dance Bard. And then Bardic Damage is going to have me use a ability score that's certainly better than Strength for me, but it isn't my primary ability score. At least with a monk, I'm raising my dexterity. With a bard, I'm definitely raising my charisma. And so I'm not going to be scaling with my to hit rolls and damage the same as even a monk will do, uh, despite getting the D10 and D12 earlier. So I think I'm okay just giving those up and putting on the medium armor and shield. Uh, so like I say, maybe lots of people have been saying this already, but that is my impression of this feature. That said, there's plenty in the College of Dance that would still make me want to play it, but this feature isn't it. Now, that's not to say this feature might not be fun. So, if you want to take off your armor so that you can use this feature because you want to punch with your monk because you're thinking of, you know, some kind of fighting dance, great, uh, do that. You know, I don't think it's a terrible option. I'm just not thinking that the sacrifice of giving up medium armor and shield, which we can get very easily, is necessarily worth what this brings us, at least from a mechanical standpoint. But from a flavor standpoint, you might like it enough that that sacrifice is worthwhile. The other third level feature you get is inspiring movement. This allows you to spend your inspiration as a reaction when an enemy ends its turn within five feet of an ally. You use your reaction, you expend the die, and then you move up to half your speed and your ally can move five times the roll of your Bardic Inspiration die. Neither your move nor your allies provoke opportunity attacks. And this is pretty good. One thing that's important here is that since your ally's movement isn't based on their speed, that means they can move even if their speed has been reduced to zero. Like, let's say they've been grappled or restrained or I think even paralyzed because they don't need to use a reaction or anything to use this, they would get to move. It's almost kind of like teleporting them, unless you're dealing with like a barrier or a wall, something like that. All right, now we need to talk about six level because the College of Dance Bard at six level gets really, really good. So at six level, leading evasion, very, very good. So this is like the evasion feature that rogues and monks get, and they don't get it to level seven, but it's actually better than their feature because you share the evasion with any allies within five feet of you. An evasion is a solid feature for both rogues and monks, so getting it a level earlier and it being better means this is very strong. 
little surprising to see the Bard better at evasion than monks and rogues. Also, at 6th level, you get Tandem Footwork, which is another banger, which I alluded to earlier. When you roll initiative, you spend an inspiration die. No reaction or anything. So this would not qualify for your bonus action unarmed strike. Then you roll the die and add the result to the initiative of a number of creatures equal to your charisma modifier, and you can choose yourself as one of those creatures if you like. This is really nice. And you can choose creatures up to 60 feet away. So, like, if you play with a Watcher's Paladin, you'll notice that everyone kind of huddles together at the beginning of combat to try to get that initiative modifier. And hopefully they win initiative before some enemy casts a fireball at them. Well, you don't have to do that with this. Though it certainly stacks with Watcher's Paladin initiative booster if you want. But it does use a resource. So there is that. But it is super strong and super nice. So level 6 is big, big, big for College of Dance. Neither of these features requires that you not wear armor, by the way. Then at 14th level, you get the Otto's Irresistible Dance spell for free, and you can cast it once for free per long rest. Or you can cast it by expending four Inspiration Dice. So this is surprising to see as well. Otto's Irresistible Dance is a 6th level spell, and usually features that let you cast additional spells kind of restrict it to 1st through 5th level spells. Now honestly, Otto's Irresistible Dance is nowhere close to the list of spells I would normally consider for preparing or casting with my 6th level slots. Without a slot though, sign me up. Otto's Irresistible Dance does not provide a saving throw to the target when you cast it, and then they have to use their action to even get a saving throw. So although I don't think that Otto's Irresistible Dance necessarily compares to the immense power that we sometimes see with 6th level spells, as a free casting, it is going to be very, very nice, especially against creatures with legendary resistance. Now, I'd have to think pretty hard about using four inspirations to cast it. Probably wouldn't do that, but the cost there is probably where it should be. And so, although I'm not that impressed with Dazzling Footwork, I do think College of Dance is very good overall. It's really going to come down to sixth level. That's when it's going to come into its own. But nice subclass. If they do want this subclass to be dancing around in no armor and making unarmed strikes though, I think they should consider improving Dazzling Footwork, and please don't flame me for this, but they should pay for that by toning down the 6th level features somewhat. Next up is the College of Glamour. Now I've never really noticed this before, but when did you Americans start spelling Glamour correctly? Didn't it get the same treatment as color? Honor, flavor, rumor, and neighbor, where you remove the use? Is this a trend? Should I expect the inclusion of the U to be a new American behavior? Anyways, I'm just inserting some humor. At level 3, enthralling performance is gone. That's the one where you perform for a minute and you could charm a crowd. That has been replaced by beguiling magic. Charm person and mirror image become free prepared spells, and if you cast any enchantment or illusion spell once per long rest or by spending an inspiration die, you can choose a creature within 60 feet and they don't need to be the target of your spell or anything like that. And then they make a wisdom saving throw. And if they fail, you can make them charmed or frightened for a minute. And then they get a saving throw at the end of each of their turns to end the effect. So you're definitely using beguiling magic once. And I think the Inspiration Die expenditure to use this again, probably a fair trade. This is a decent feature. I don't think it's super powerful, but it's not bad. And it has some nice synergy with a feature we're going to get later. Also at third level, we're going to get Mantle of Inspiration, like we did before. And it is mostly the same as it used to be. You use a bonus action, you spend an Inspiration, you give yourself and your allies some temporary hit points, and you give them the opportunity to use their reaction for some movement. So... Here's what changed here. The old version gave a set amount of temporary hit points, and now it's twice your inspiration die roll. So it's going to end up being a similar amount of temporary hit points, but more random. The other change is you used to need to pick creatures you could see, and that could see you. And that restriction is gone. Otherwise, it's the same. I generally see Glamour Bards using this as a way to get allies out of harmful effects before those harmful effects take place. For example... A web spell gets cast and a couple members of your party are in the effect. 
they make their saving throw at the start of their turns or get restrained. So if you use Mantle of Inspiration to allow them to move out of the web before the start of their turns, then they don't have to make the saving throw. And so I see this feature used for that kind of thing. It is a pretty good feature. It does rely on the speed of the ally. So this isn't like inspiring movement where they could walk out of a grapple, but it is still fairly useful. At sixth level, Mantle of Majesty is very similar to the current Glamour Bard. So this one allows you to cast Command as a bonus action and you start concentrating. And for the next minute, as long as you maintain that concentration, you can keep casting Command as a bonus action. And should a creature be charmed by you, it automatically fails its saving throw. So there's three improvements here over the original version. The first is that you also get the command spell as a free preparation, meaning you can cast it with your spell slots. And yes, you might want to do that instead of the bonus action thing because command normally doesn't use concentration and it upcasts really well. Now what I do wonder is, can you choose to upcast command as a bonus action with the concentration thing? Obviously, that would use a spell slot, because if you cast something without a spell slot, it's always at its lowest level, unless it specifically says otherwise, and I can think of zero examples of that. But based on the wording here, I don't think you can. The second improvement is that you can set up the bonus action command thing more than once per long rest. You just need to expand a spell slot of third level or higher, and I think that's maybe worth it. I think it's probably the right cost. And the third improvement is the synergy with this and the new Beguiling Magic 3rd level feature that can charm or frighten an enemy when you cast an enchantment or illusion spell. So let's say you cast Vicious Mockery, which is an enchantment spell, and you use your Beguiling Magic on an enemy, and they fail their saving throw, so you choose to give them the charm condition. Then you can use your bonus action to cast Command on them with Mantle of Majesty, and because they're charmed by you, they automatically fail their saving throw. That's a nice combination, and it wasn't an option before. And Unbreakable Majesty at 14th level. So this is the way it used to work, is you used your bonus action, you set this up, and for the next minute, anyone who tried to attack you had to make a charisma saving throw, and if they failed that saving throw, they had to choose a different target. Now, the saving throw is made after the enemy hits you with an attack. They make their saving throw, or the hit is turned into a miss. And since they haven't hit you yet on their turn, if they have another attack and hit you with that, they make the saving throw again, or miss again, and so on. So this is just better, right? Instead of choosing another target, now they just miss, and that sounds good to me. So overall, Glamour, with a U, is better here. Enough said. Let's move on to one of the most unfortunate casualties of the Expert Class's playtest, the Lore Bard. So the Lore Bard was really strange in the Expert Class's playtest and not very good. Additional Magical Secrets was replaced with a feature that allowed a creature rolling your inspiration to roll twice and take the better result. And that's fine, but I'm not sure what that has to do with lore. And then there was a feature where you could do psychic damage to an enemy. And again, I don't know what that has to do with lore. Anyways, let's talk about this lore bard. Three bonus proficiencies at level three. This is just like the 2014 lore bard. The Expert Classes playtest made you take Arcana, History, and Nature. I've said this before, and I'll say this again. This is a decent feature, but remember that with Jack of All Trades, you are getting half your proficiency bonus on any skill check you aren't proficient in, so this isn't quite the same value as it would be for a different class. And then you get Cutting Words, and this is mostly the same as the 2014 version. The notable change here is the old version doesn't work if the creature can't hear you or is immune to being charmed. And those restrictions are gone. And I have mixed feelings on that. I mean, I appreciate fewer restrictions, but this feature is called Cutting Words, and it's described as using your wits to hinder the enemy, and they don't need to hear you. I mean, it just seems a little weird to me. Then at level 6, Additional Magical Secrets is renamed to Magical Discoveries. Works for me. And you learn two spells of your choice that are cantrips or spells for which you have spell slots. And you can switch them out. Even upgrade them to higher level spells that you have slots for when you gain bard levels. Like with Magical Secrets, the obvious downgrade here is that certain spells aren't on any of those lists anymore. So you can't choose them. But two additional spells and you can upgrade? It seems like a decent compromise. 
I assume this part here, as shown on the bar table, means that if you are multi-classed, so you have spell slots of a higher level than any spell you can cast, those would not be available because you're looking at spell slots as shown on the bard table, not the multi-class spellcaster table. Or at least I think that's what it means. Then at 14th level, peerless skill. Okay, so the old version basically allows you to use bardic inspiration whenever you make an ability check and add it to the roll. With the usual after the roll, but before you know the results wording. The new version can now be applied to an ability check or an attack roll, though what attack roll is your 14th level lore bard doing? Uh, maybe some kind of spell attack roll, I guess? Anyways, the dice applied after the roll fails, so you can't boost your initiative anymore, but you can boost counterspell, telekinesis, or other ability checks like that, and there's a really nice bonus here that you don't expend the bardic inspiration if the check still fails. So overall, this is a huge improvement over the Expert Classes playtest version and more comparable to the 2014 version. In some ways, it's a little better. In others, it's a little worse. But overall, I think it does okay. This one is a little bit less exciting to me, and I don't think it's bad or anything like that. But compared to the other three subclasses, this is probably the one I'm least excited for. So that might just be personal taste. And finally, College of Valor. Combat Inspiration is pretty close to the 2014 version with two little boosts. The first is the defense option. It says here in the design notes, the option is now triggered by being hit. Previously, it said, alternatively, when an attack roll is made against a creature, it can use its reaction to roll the Bardic Inspiration die and add the number rolled to its armor class against that attack after seeing the roll, but before knowing whether it hits or misses. And again, at least at the tables I play at, this is going to be functionally the same. I do not have DMs, thankfully, who roll the die and then wait for me to announce whether I'm spending inspiration before announcing whether they hit or miss. It's more like, does 17 hit you? And then I say, yeah, but I'll spend combat inspiration. And that's always been okay. That's essentially how it works now, but at least the wording now matches how I've been using it, and I assume most tables have been using it. Once again, if you use it the way it was written in the 2014 Player's Handbook, and you like it that way, I'd love to hear about it and hear why you like it. Then there's the offense option. Previously, this specified that it could be applied to a weapons damage roll, and now it's just a damage roll applied after an attack. So it could be like an Eldritch Blast or whatever. Now, I've been playing with the optional class features for the past few years, and the optional Magical Inspiration Bard class feature let the character with Inspiration add it to spell damage already. And not just attacks, any spell that dealt damage could get that boost. So at least at my table, neither of these changes are going to end up being boosts for the Valor Bard. It's pretty much going to operate the same as it always has. The other third level feature is Martial Training, and this one actually has gotten better. So first off, it allows the Bard to use their weapon as a spellcasting focus, which is nice. And pretty please allow casters to do somatic components for any spell while holding a spell focus. They haven't tackled spell components in the rules yet, but this seems like an obvious thing to change to make the rules simpler. The current rules for components are complex and convoluted, and it just needs to be streamlined. The other boost here is that you're actually getting more weapon proficiencies with this because those proficiencies that the base bard class doesn't get anymore. So previously, the bard was already proficient with rapiers and longswords, etc., before getting this feature. So this is a pretty big boost to weapon proficiencies. Then our 6th and 14th level features are the same as they are in the 2014 Player's Handbook. So the College of Valor is pretty close to where it was as well. It's maybe slightly boosted. And that is the final subclass. So I want to do more of a total analysis here. Uh, so the first thing I'll mention is, compared to the Expert Classes Playtest Bard, I like this one a whole lot more, despite the loss of Reaction Inspiration. I loved Inspiration as a reaction. I'm really sorry to see it go. Obviously, I'm disappointed in that. But there's a lot of other stuff here. And overall, I think it just got much, much better. Uh, and in terms of the spell casting, which is probably the biggest change, 
I am all for it. The old uh, version in the expert classes playtest was really restrictive. And, you know, I, I talk to people who play bards all the time who struggle with the spell list of the 2014 bard. And now you're not going to have that anymore. And you have this kind of jack of all trades in terms of spell casting. And I've seen some comments and had some questions about does this bard mean that, you know, it's now the best spellcaster in the game? And I talked about that before. I don't necessarily think it is. But where I do think it does change how I look at the bard is if, not necessarily if I'm planning on a bard, but if I'm planning on a cleric or a druid. Because if I'm planning on a cleric, then I might think about the bard. And I might go, you know, I'm going to get the same spellcasting progression, same spells. Which do I want? Do I want channel divinity or do I want inspiration? And I might look at the subclasses as well, of course. I might look at the fact that the cleric doesn't have to take a first level feat to get good armor. Uh, so there's a couple factors there, but they're comparable enough that I might consider either. It might be more of a flavor choice than a mechanical choice. And the same thing with the druid. Unless I'm planning on focusing on wild shape. If I'm planning on focusing on spells with the druid, I'm going to think about a bard. And do I want to take a bard with the primal spell list? Same progression, same spells. Do I want inspiration or do I want wild shape? And that's really the selection. And as well, look at the subclasses and determine what I want. But those are the comparisons where I think it's really going to change how I look at character building from now on. Now, in terms of the subclasses, College of Dance, I really like it. I think it's really good. I do think that if you want that character to give up wearing armor and use dazzling footwork, that feature should be made better. And I do think there's so much given to the College of Dance at level 6, that could be scaled back. And then you would have this balance, and it would, you know, give the dance bard a reason to go with the unarmored and go around and do the unarmed strikes and all that because i do think that sounds fun but i don't think it's good enough for the sacrifice you make to do that one feature and i do think that's fixable in terms of glamour i really like the new glamour i like the new combinations that are available with lore and valor i'm just less excited and the reason is because they're so close to the 2014 versions and I've played the 2014 versions many many times and as I said earlier in this video I'm more excited about new options and new toys these don't seem like new toys to me they seem like the same old and those subclasses have always been fine there's nothing wrong with them but they're not new or exciting anymore uh, so I would have liked to have seen more changes there but overall I mean there's nothing wrong with those subclasses I think they're perfectly viable so overall, the Bard, I think I'm pleased to see that it is better than it was. Uh, I think this Bard is better than the 2014 version. I think it's better than the Expert Classes version. I think it's a big winner in this particular playtest. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to be talking about the rest of the classes. And that'll take a little while because there's a lot there. This is a hefty document. So we're just going to go by it piece by piece until we get through it. Uh, so I hope you will join me. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. I love being able to do this full-time, and I am only able to do so because of the patrons of this channel. Check out the link in the video description if you are considering becoming a patron. But today I want to specifically call out my Archmage-level patrons. So thank you so much to Aaron Kaler, Aiden Potter, Benjamin, Brett McDowell, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Lotz, David W. Skibbins, Gar, Gakumaru, Ian Johnson, James Thomas, John Cripps, Jonathan Lexi, KJ Aurelio, Kevin Casey, Kurt G, Cavate, Leonardo Gonzalez, Marlon Rooks, Migish, Nick Simmons, Rysquai, Sadkioni7, Stephen Edmondson, and TUM. Thanks so much to all of you for your support. And Aiden Potter and Leonardo Gonzalez are both new Archmage-level patrons. Thank you so much.